Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter where you live, what kind of car you drive, what kind of job you have. It doesn't matter if you pay $20,000 a year in tuition for your kid to go to the best high school. We have to be diligent because no matter what we think, how we think, how perfect our lives are, none of that matters because this drug, it doesn't discriminate. It, it comes in um, very quietly and very seductively and ruins people's lives without them even seeing it coming. Where the danger comes in, I think, for a lot of addicted substances is they actually can cause changes in the brain. Your brain is still evolving up until your mid-20s. So the younger someone is, the more likely it is they're going to have an effect on their brain and be um, more severely addicted down the line and have a harder time quitting. We were the family that had dinner at the table every night. We were the family that had the batting cage in the backyard and had all the kids over all the time. We were the family that talked about drugs, sex, alcohol. He went to private school the first part of his, of his life and, and just excelled. Then he got involved in football and just absolutely loved it, loved it. My son actually started playing football, peewee football, when he was a youngster. Michael was a triathlete. He played soccer, basketball, and baseball. Baseball was his passion. And while playing soccer in 10th grade, he had a knee injury and was prescribed narcotics. Oxycontin with three refills. That's about 90 pills. He was about 16 years old, and he was a wrestler and a football player. Broke his collarbone, and he had to do surgery, and he needed pain meds after the surgery because he was in a lot of pain. I have seen athletes deal with painkillers and, and, and struggle with um, painkillers and addictions and so forth. At the time, um, as a coach, I could see it in the athletes. I, I, I recognized definite changes in that particular athlete or those particular athletes, uh, but I didn't see it in my own son. For parents who thought we knew what was going on all around us. We were clueless. I am a licensed mental health counselor, a professional in the field. I did not see the signs due to, I believe, love and manipulation from our children. The manipulation you don't see as a parent. It was a day surgery and so when he was in the recovery room, you know, we just met with the, the discharge nurse and she gave us the, the prescriptions and, you know, there was no conversation or anything like that. It was just, here's his prescriptions and let us know if you have any questions. I feel like with uh, kind of each successive generation, the kids are getting a little bit bigger, a little bit faster, a little bit stronger. And when you have these bigger, stronger bodies that are better trained and moving faster and moving harder, uh, it seems like extremities, elbows, shoulders, knees, ankles, uh, they, we seem to be picking up more frequent injuries in these areas. They don't want to let their parents down. They don't want to let their coaches down. They don't want to let their team down. And so they try to compete through these injuries. There's, you know, different degrees of injury, obviously, but most injuries, I think, can be treated um, conservatively. And you may have heard the expression rice, which is when uh, you have a sprain or a contusion or something like that. The treatment is rest, ice, compression, and elevation. And then if you need a medication, usually a non-opiate, over-the-counter medication like ibuprofen or Motrin or Tylenol can treat the vast majority of minor injuries that, um, you know, athletes will sustain. No matter how much I stretched or tried to be flexible, it was just very hard to do what I wanted to do. Like I couldn't move as fast, move as quickly as I wanted to. So to do that, usually I'd, um, I'd swim. Um, some girls did yoga, they went to chiropractors, which I did too, but in the end, I just needed rest, honestly. If it's a more serious injury, like say a fracture, you know, or a compound fracture, that kind of thing, um, that probably is more significant pain that may require an opiate medication, but for a very short period of time, you know, maybe for just a couple of days. 
Uh, in fact, there's very few injuries that we require more than just a few days of, of a medication that's strong. The issue that changes is with long-term. So long-term pain from an injury, opiates are never the first-line treatment. So with long-term pain, or what we might call chronic pain, we want to try all of the non-opiates first. And that includes medicines like Tylenol and ibuprofen. But the other reason to look for alternatives is that teens in general are more open to experimenting and trying different things uh, that may not be safe for them. Uh, this is when substance use and risk taking is very high and so it's an at-risk population anyway and so we really want to limit their exposure to um, not only intoxicating substances, but especially those uh, that are particularly dangerous, and opiates are very dangerous. Pain does guide you when you have an injury, because it tells you the location, it tells you the severity, you're going to be able to feel it. In sports injuries, you'd want to know if that injury is worse. And if you're masking that pain with opioids, there's really no way to know. As it mends, the pain will decrease. And so it's gonna tell me that it's healing. Let's say you give the child strong medications for the, for the broken bone. She won't know if it's healing or not because she doesn't feel the pain. And so it's, pain is a, is a life saver. And a little pain won't hurt you. I think, I think sometimes we want our society to be pain free. The difficulty, not only for parents, but for coaches as well, you see these changes and there was always a parallel excuse for it. And there always seemed to be a parallel excuse. For parents who think that their children would never do this, um, you've got to take everything that's different about them and think, you have to think the worst. It's gonna save their life in the end. You want to believe that, that what they're telling you is the truth, but um, I've learned through addiction that, that uh, you have to question everything. All of the stuff that we saw were typical teenage th things. My sister-in-law always said, when they turn 13, the devil moves in, or they become an alien. And so we would laugh about that. That's what we thought. He was just going through typical teenage stuff. He was in junior year. Um, I noticed behavior changes. Um, extreme weight loss. I think he had lost like 30 pounds and I thought that was due to conditioning. He had changed his diet and I was like wow you know he's he's really dedicated to football. There was an inkling that something wasn't right. There was something in my gut that was telling me that something wasn't right but it really wasn't enough for me to do anything drastic about it. As mothers, as parents, I think we have a sixth sense almost of any indication of behavior changes. And it all boils down to behavior changes. What is normal, what is not normal. So the signs of a developing addiction are pretty varied. So a parent should be concerned if they see less of their kid. Or if the young person is acting differently Maybe they're more moody. Maybe they're more absent. Maybe they're more irritable. Um, sometimes they might disappear. I can't find my, my teenager or they're not responding to my calls when they used to be very responsive. I mean, him not calling me back on his cell phone, him not texting me back. He was disappearing for a couple hours at a time with me not knowing where he was at. Others are if money is disappearing if uh, objects of value are disappearing and they can't be accounted for. And then I started noticing my credit cards were being charged and he would be stealing my credit cards in the evenings and going to either Walgreens and buying um, the gift cards and then going to cash them out to get his drug of choice. Other things are if medications disappear. I found an empty prescription bottle in his room that was my dad's painkiller prescription from sometime in the 1980s. 
we trust the doctor's advice and we trust what they're giving us too much sometimes. And you know, I, I think that we know ourselves, we know our kids, we know um, ourselves better than the doctor does, especially if, you're, if it's not your regular family physician, you may only see them for a few minutes. And so I do think we need to question that. They should ask what the diagnosis is, what's actually wrong with it. Is it a muscle, is it a ligament, is it a bone? Is it a vessel? What is wrong? Then ask for the treatment without medication because many of these injuries can be treated without any medication and very successfully and without much pain. Kinesio tape is great. Physical therapists can do that. So a physical therapist seeing somebody like that, a chiropractor, um, cold therapy, hot therapy, hot tub swimming. There's just more out there than going to a, a regular doctor and getting pills. If the physician uh, is recommending a medication, don't be afraid to say, does he really need that? Or does she really need that? You know, can we get by with ibuprofen? Can we get by with Tylenol? There's a lot of concern about putting young people on opiates. That is because the developing brain, especially in an adolescent, is particularly sensitive to addictions. It's developing, it's not yet fully formed, and so exposure to addictive substances can increase the chances of developing an addiction more than if they were started in adulthood. If an opiate is recommended, and again, that's usually a, a fracture, something to that degree, a broken clavicle, you know, a, a fractured femur, that kind of thing. And an opiate's being recommended, make sure that the doctor is giving the lowest effective dose, uh, the lowest number of pills, and again, rarely is more than just a few days, maybe three days needed. Make sure there aren't refills, because that's usually done for the convenience of both the doctor and perhaps the parents. If the pain is still there to the point that opiates are needed after a few days, it's time to call the doctor again and have the pain reevaluated. If you are prescribed the opiates, the parents should not relinquish responsibility in administering the medication. Parents should be administering it, monitor that medication, and lock it up. If they don't need it anymore, then get rid of it. I tell parents, treat it like a loaded gun. You wouldn't leave a loaded gun laying around on the countertop. You shouldn't leave meds that are dangerous and addictive on the countertop either. Because even if your child isn't taking them, they might know somebody at school that's willing to buy them. I think we as consumers are, are partially to blame for this, this problem because, you know, we want a quick fix. We don't want to have to go to, to physical therapy. We want our pain to go away, whether it's emotional pain or physical pain. We want a pill, a magic pill, that's going to take all that away. And that's what our kids see, and that's what our kids want too. They want the magic bullet, and sometimes that can lead to life altering and sometimes um, death. So I went to the first place that I could think about, sent him to an inpatient rehab outside of Albuquerque for 30 days, um, and I had my son back for a moment. Ultimately, he had an accidental overdose. He was 19. The kid who was gonna go off to play college ball and ultimately, in his mind, he knew he was gonna do great things, um, didn't survive his addiction. 16. He was 16 when he started. Uh, he was 18, almost 19, when he passed away. So he was about two months shy of his 19th birthday. He had taken a synthetic opiate that looked identical to Oxycontin. And he died. He stopped breathing March 11th of this year. He had just turned 21. Parents have to not let the stigma and shame keep them from asking for help and reaching out. Have an open dialogue about drugs and alcohol because our kids are going to get exposed to it. No matter what school they go to, no matter what extracurricular activities they're involved in, they're going to get offered things and they're going to have exposure to it and their friends are going to be doing it. Please. 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 Think about this. Talk about this. With your children. With your children. Children. With your children. With your children.